All right, so well, we've been uh, talking about uh, research design and research methodology. And in our previous discussion, we basically tried to distinguish what's the difference between uh, research methods and research design. And we said that research uh, design is an overall plan for the research, which we basically need before we uh, go on and proceed with the research because without a plan, uh, we don't know what kind of data will we need, how are we going to collect it, uh, what's the research question that will be guiding our research, what kind of theory will we use. So all these things we don't know, which are crucial to the research, of course, and we don't know, we, we won't be able to know it if we don't have a research design. <clears throat> but uh, the me method, on the other hand, is uh, a bit uh, smaller in scope when it comes to... Uh, uh, when you compare it to research design because methodology is just simply a part of research design and when we talk about methodology it basically pertains to at least uh, three things that we need to consider the first one is the type of data that is needed that, now that is a very important for us to note what type of data do we need well there are at least two kinds of data qualitative data and quantitative data <clears throat> so um, when it comes to choosing the proper methodology it is crucial for us to consider first what do we want to know what are our objectives say for instance if your question entails uh, a kind of measurement or levels well perhaps what you need is quantitative data because quantitative data is a kind of data that is uh, or could be expressed through numbers or figures, which is in contrast with qualitative data. Well, certainly qualitative data cannot be expressed through numbers or figures. When we talk about qualitative data, we're talking here about narratives, thick descriptions, and even textual data. So, those two types of data, you need to think first, what kind of data do you need? It also depends on the kind of questions and objectives that you pose. Because let's say, for instance, your objective is to measure or to look for a significant difference or if there is a relationship among the variables or if you want to test a theory you want to predict something or you want to explain something, then you fall into quantitative type of data. Because you, you cannot use qualitative data if you want to measure something. You cannot test a theory or you cannot explain a, a phenomenon by just simply making use of qualitative data because that's not the purpose of having qualitative data. <clears throat> On the other hand, when we talk about qualitative data, our objectives is more focused on understanding patterns of meaning. So it's not re when, you, when, when we are doing qualitative research, it's not really so much as you know we want to explain or uh, you know we're seeking some sort of uh, 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 explanation to a particular phenomenon. We're looking with relationship of variables. No. That's not the point in doing qualitative research. We do qualitative research because we want to look into the patterns of meaning. Um, <clears throat> crucial to this uh, idea in qualitative research is basically the standpoint of constructivists. Constructivists believe that action or human behavior, political action included, is basically motivated by ideas. So what is in your mind? So when we talk about ideas, uh, we basically mean mean things such as uh, identities, beliefs, opinions, worldviews. So these are the things that we are talking about when we when we talk about idea. And this is of course heavily influenced by culture. It's heavily influenced by uh, our beliefs, our orientation, even our religion has a very strong impact to the ideas that we have in mind. And so, 
when we are actually looking for the reason for an action, constructivists will say, well, you've got to look into ide to ideas. Why? Because these ideas basically constitute patterns of meaning. And these patterns of meaning motivate the individual to do something. So behind all kinds of political action, constructivists will say, it's basically patterns of ideas. And so for, for constructivists and uh, qualitativists basically <clears throat> uh, got a lot from the constructivist idea that the point of doing political inquiry is actually to understand patterns of meaning. So there you have it. Okay? You, you, you don't choose quantitative or qualitative research approach or methodology because one is easier than the other. No, that's, that's not how it works. Okay? Always bear in mind that you are choosing uh, a particular type of data or data method or a research methodology because you are aligning it with what you seek, with what you want, with your objectives, with your research questions. Okay? So, now, <clears throat> we have said that quantitative data is basically data that could be expressed through numbers and uh, uh, figures. And uh, most of the time, we make use of quantitative data in survey research. In, in, in a survey research, we make you, so we have an instrument in a survey research, in okay, the survey instrument, where you uh, ask respondents several questions. But of course, that question is basically formed into um, uh, an organized pattern of questions, which was designed to in order to, to fulfill a particular task. Okay? And so, you, we make use of Likert scale, okay? We make use of Likert scale. And so, uh, after that, we can actually measure variables. And not only that we can measure variables, but we can also correlate these variables. Basically, that's what we do in quantitative research. <clears throat> in qualitative research, I've said a while ago that basically the data that we have here are texts, textual data, which are very descriptive and in the form of a narrative. Because here, in, in, in a narrative descriptive data, we can find patterns of meaning. Meaning is deeply embedded in, this, in the narration of, you know, uh, the interpretation of the person whom you are interviewing. Okay. Now, uh, next... Okay, so we, we have said so far that when we talk about methodology, it is important for us to note what kind or what type of data do we need. Next, when we talk about data collection techniques. Um, so now we're saying that, okay, when we, talk, when we talk about methodology, first one, we need to know what kind or what type of data do we need. Will it be quantitative or qualitative? And of course, that depends on our objectives and the research questions that we want to answer. Second, how do we collect now the data? Okay, the data collection technique or strategy or process. Because, let's say for instance, you have chosen to, to gather quantitative data. So meaning to say data that could be expressed through figures and numbers. You cannot, let's say, collect quantitative data through the use of, let's say, an interview. Because when you interview someone, what you will get is basically a descriptive narrative of that person's experiences. Okay? That might be more suitable to a qualitative methodology. But if you're doing quantitative research and you want to gather quantitative data, you can just simply make use of an interview. Because it's difficult for an interview to be transformed into <clears throat> something quantifiable, something measurable. <clears throat> so, as I've said a while ago, <clears throat> when we make use of quantitative research, most of the time we make use of survey instruments. So, the process of collating, collecting data is through the process of making or constructing a survey instrument. 
And once the survey instrument is constructed, you now allow the respondents to answer the survey questionnaires. Now, making uh, the survey questionnaire is uh, a bit more complicated. Although, uh, I would love to dig deeper in, into this into a, a separate discussion. But let me just provide an overview. Um, a survey instrument is supposed to be valid. That's really very important. Okay? When we make use of a survey instrument, we have to make sure that the survey form or the survey instrument or questionnaire that we are making really corresponds to, number one, the research questions. Because ultimately, what we want to answer is basically the research questions. So you have to make sure that the questions in the survey instrument are so constructed in order that when respondents respond to them or answer them, when you analyze, you'll be able to answer the research question. Second, you have to make sure that this question really works. Okay? These questions that you are constructing really works. Well, there are actually several ways to do that. Okay? Once you're done constructing the survey instrument, you allow experts to review your instrument. Okay? You allow experts to review. You, are, you, you allow uh, statisticians. You consult statisticians. Uh, you, consult experts, you consult experts in your field so that they can review and provide some insights on how you, know, you, can, you can modify or what's the weaknesses of your survey instrument. And then after that, you can actually uh, perform uh, validation techniques. There are actually validation techniques that, that could be done. Say, for instance, you can test your instrument. Before uh, you use your instrument in the sample population that you have chosen, you could test the instrument. So, uh, from the same population, you can get a small portion of that population and ask them to respond to your survey. By then, you can actually evaluate whether you will be able to get the data that you need. So, before you use your survey instrument into the larger data set, you just choose a small portion of that and then test, test the, the survey instrument. Okay? And there are actually uh, uh, statistical uh, formulas or treatments that could be used, like uh, Cronbach Alpha, for instance, in order to test, to test the reliability of your questions in your survey instrument. Okay? So, making use of a survey instrument is a bit more tedious. Okay? So, that's how you collect quantitative data. Because in, in the survey instrument, you have a Likert scale, and then you ask your respondents to, to choose. It's like um, agree, uh, ah, uh, what do you call it? Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly uh, disagree. So, something like that. So, in a way, there, there's this, uh, we call it Likert scale. Okay, so your respondents can just, can just simply take these boxes, and then later on you can you can uh, collate the data, and then in a way you can also measure these concepts through the use of these survey instruments. After measuring them, you can even correlate them with other variables or other concepts. Okay, so that's how you collect quantitative data. When it comes to qualitative data, there are well at least. Uh, several techniques that, uh, well, there are many techniques or strategies to collect qualitative data. But uh, I think the most basic strategies to collect qualitative data is, of course, number one, interviews. I personally uh, believe that uh, this is the best uh, way to collect qualitative data. In an interview, it actually involves at least two types of interpretation. The interpretation of the person whom you are interviewing, your key informant. Your key informant has, a, has his or her own interpretation of the things that are happening in her or in his life. When it comes to his or her experiences, he could have, you know, various interpretations of it. And when you talk to him, when you ask questions about those experiences, he will respond using those interpretations that he have in mind. Okay, so that's the first level. And the second level 
basically is the interpretation of your of the researcher it is your interpretation okay because um, when you when you ask questions of course you're asking the person his interpretation of his own actions and then when you analyze the data later on you are again involved in interpretation it seems that you are interpreting the interpretation of your key informant. Okay? So basically, that's what happens in an interview. In an, in, in an interview, uh, you ask qualitative questions. Remember that when you make use of qualitative uh, methodology, what you want is basically to understand patterns of meaning, to look and try to make sense of these patterns of meaning. And you can only get that if um, you can ask your key informant to be more open to you. Okay? So, the key informant has to be more open to you. So that he or she will be able to openly say what, what he or she wants. And it's the only time that you can gain a deeper insight on how he or she interprets his or her own experience. Uh, experiences. It is, it is done through an interview. Well, there are many strategies you know, on how to uh, to do an interview. Okay, we're gonna dig deeper into this in the coming uh, discussions. Okay, but for now, I think uh, it's enough for us to um, to describe interview in such a way that you no, know, you'll be able to understand that through but or by asking qualitative questions your key informants, you are actually soliciting their own interpretation of their own experiences. And from there, you get patterns of meanings. And later on, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna analyze these uh, data. Now, um, interviews could be at least uh, three types. Structured interviews, the first one. The second one is unstructured interview. And the third one is what we call semi-structured interview. So again, this depends. Okay? This depends on uh, the expertise, the level of expertise of the researcher. Uh, all of these three types of interview have their own positive and negative sides. For instance, when we talk about structured interview, this is very helpful when it comes to those inexperienced, when it comes to uh, doing qualitative interviews. You need a lot of experience to do qualitative interviews. Remember that you are soliciting deep insights here. Things or ideas that your key informants might not be consciously aware. Can you even imagine that? Okay, so that, re that requires the experience of you know, a researcher. But if you don't have that experience yet, it's okay. It's okay. So before you go into the interview, you make sure that you know you have already uh, you have already written questions, guide questions. So where will these guide questions come from? Well, basically, you look into the theory because the theory in a qualitative research is your guide. Look into the research questions. Look into the literature. Try to evaluate your insights about the phenomenon that you are evaluating. And from there, you can craft the questions. Now, one thing that you need to really consider is that, remember, when you are crafting your interview questions, you have to make sure that they are aligned with your research questions. Why? Because ultimately, you'll be responding to these research questions. You'll be answering these research questions. And you'll be using the data, the qualitative data that will be gathered in the interview. So you have to make sure that the questions that you are asking your key informants are aligned with your research questions. The last thing that we would, that we would want to happen is that when the interview is done, the qualitative data is gathered, and yet the research questions are not answered. Right? We don't want to do that. So you have to make sure. You always need to think. When you craft the, re the interview questions, Always bear in mind, what are your research questions? Will I be able to answer these research questions when I ask these interview questions? Okay. Now, we said it's a structured interview because 
your your means of questioning, your line of questioning is limited to that guide that you have written prior to the interview. It's structured. So, so the course of the interview is limited to the structure of the guide. Okay? The negative side of that is that it's la it lacks flexibility. It lacks flexibility. Because there are, in there are instances in an interview where you will really need to you know, to dig deeper, probe concepts, probe responses, you know, uh, have follow-up questions. You can't do that in a structured interview. Okay? Well, you can do that if you can at least uh, foresee uh, the responses of your, how you will, how your uh, respondents will basically respond to your question. So that prior to the interview, you can craft questions on how to probe these possible responses. Okay? But then again, you know, there are a lot of things that could be uh, unforeseen during an interview. And a very structured interview, interview guide, won't be able to flexi flexibly respond to these uh, uh, emerging intricacies that could happen. Now, on the other hand, we have an unstructured interview. So it's just the contrary of a structured interview. In a structured interview, you're limited to the, the guide questions that you have. In an unstructured interview, you don't have guide questions. You don't have guide questions. Well, the positive uh, side to this is that um, you, you'll be able to get deeper insights. Why? Because you're gonna be involved in a conversation. Not just an interview, but the interview becomes a conversation, a dialogue between you and your key informant or the person whom you are interviewing. And in that way, since we are looking for deep insights here, patterns of meaning, this is a qualitative research. So, uh, that's, that's the positive side to it. You're gonna be able to solicit more. But the negative side of it, the downside to it is that it could take long. It could take long because before you know it, you could be circling around ideas and you know, you might be even involved into, uh, you, you might even be, uh, uh, you know, uh, for all we know, uh, your discussions could be uh, turning into a kind of vicious circle. So just circling around over and over again, it, it confuses you, it confuses the person whom you are interviewing, and you know, if that happens, well, you, um, you forgo with the focus. Okay? Remember that you need to focus because there are things that you want to know. When you just circle on our ideas, ten tendency is, uh, you know, you, you forget your focus, right? You forget the reason why you're even asking these questions. And another downside to it is it could take long. It could take long. So if you don't have the resources to do, what, two, three-hour interview, you better, be, you better be prepared with a guide. But the thing is, if you're limited to a structured interview, it lacks flexibility. And so I think... Uh, what captures the best of both worlds, <laughs> best of both worlds when it, come to, when it comes to um, structured and unstructured is basically semi-structured. In a semi-structured interview, you have a guide. Okay? You have an interview guide. But the good thing about this is that, well, you have a guide, meaning to say you'll be guided with the questioning you won't be lost with the discussions with your key informant. And also, also, there's flexibility. Why? Because you are not limited to your guide, unlike in a structured interview. In a structured interview, you're limited to the guide. Here, you have a guide, and the guide could not even be questions. Your interview guide could even be ideas, concepts, phrases, things that you understand. Things that allows you to remember what you want to ask your respondents. Okay? And your discussion with the respondents, your interview with the respondents is not imprisoned 
in that guy because you can probe, you can follow up, you can respond to emerging uh, situations during the interview. And so personally, I will suggest that you make use of a semi-structured interview. So those are the three types of interview that you can get. Now, another type of um, uh, collection of qualitative data is uh, participant observation. What do we do in participant observation? Well, we basically observe. We observe. We observe our respondents in their uh, natural setting. You observe them while they're doing the things that they normally do. What we want to understand is basically how do they do things in the ordinary course of their businesses, of their lives. That's where the patterns of meaning could be solicited. And the good thing about participant observation is that you're not just simply observing. You are participating in the activity. So the good side to it is that, in a way, you, you are in the process putting yourself into the shoes of your respondents. And this is actually a good thing because you can gain a better insight, a better understanding of their experiences, what do they feel, what do they imagine, Okay. And, uh, you know, it, it allows you to see the world through the lenses of their own consciousness. Okay? So this is a good thing about participant observation. Well, most of the time, um, you can partner interview with participant observation. You can interview respondents and at the same time, you could also participate in the activities that they are doing because there might be uh, behaviors that you can observe while they are in the ordinary course of their business. And you, you can even partake in it so that you gain a better insight or understanding of the things that they are doing. Another means of uh, collecting qualitative data is uh, through the use of focus group discussions. Okay, Again, a focus group discussions could be partnered with qualitative interviews. The good thing about focus group discussion is that uh, there's a group, five to seven or to eight people, five to eight people, okay? You allow them to talk amongst themselves, discuss things about themselves. But you're there. As a researcher, you're there guiding and facilitating the discussion so that the discussion will not go overboard, so that uh, there will still be focus in the discussion, okay? So it allows the participants to, to express themselves, to talk to each other, express themselves in a way you can observe them, uh, you can better capture the patterns of meaning uh, that are embedded in their conversations, in their discussions. But I think the downside to, uh, uh, to an FGD is when you're doing an FGD to, with, with participants who are not, uh, who are not used to group discussions. In this case, chances are they won't be able to completely articulate themselves. Um, what's worse, they could just simply be nodding their heads in acquiescence to uh, what the other participants are saying because they don't want to be marginalized, they don't want to be judged, and so it defeats the purpose of the FGD. So, if you're gonna do an FGD, you have to make sure that you'll be, you'll be facilitating the discussions in a smooth manner so that, you know, the participants will, will not feel inhibited, will feel that, you know, uh, they're allowed to say what they want and they're free to say what they want. Okay? So, those are at least the three, there are other uh, types of data collection techniques. But of course, uh, for purposes of this video, let's focus on just three. Interview, participant, inter uh, participant observation, and focus group discussion. Okay? So now, we have an idea okay, on the two uh, essential parts of methodology. The type of data could be quanti, quali. It depends on your objective. And then, the types of uh, data collection procedures. 
interview, participant observation, or focus group discussion. Now, the third essential or integral part of methodology is basically the part where you analyze or interpret the data that you're able to gather. Okay? So now you know the data. You know how to collect them. But the thing is, how will you interpret or analyze the data? Well, when it comes to quantitative research, as we have said, um, data here is expressed through uh, numeric figures. And so we can make use of statistical treatments in order to uh, to manipulate the data, you know, understand the data, you know, do something about the data so that we can establish correlations and what have you. Okay? On the, on the qualitative uh, methodology, uh, it's, it's more complicated, it seems, because your data cannot just simply express through numbers and there, there's no statistical formula that could help you analyze qualitative data. So what you need is to transcribe the data first. Turn it into something textual. Remember that the data you have is coming from an interview. It's verbal. So you need to transform it into something textual. So... Your data is now transformed into text. So it's going to take you, you know, long hours. A, a one-hour interview could, you know, could last you six to seven hours transcribing uh, the interview. Now, once you're done with uh, the transcription, you now start with the coding of your qualitative data. Okay, later on we're gonna dig deeper into what really is coding. But for now, let's just settle for this idea that coding is actually a means of labeling ideas because you need to organize your qualitative data. Right? You need to organize because uh, they're textual, but they're not yet organized. They're not yet organized. And how do you organize them? Uh, you look for patterns. You look for uh, similarities, differences, and through these, put labels. Okay? Codes are actually labels. Okay? So you label ideas that are, you, you try to group together ideas that are capable of being grouped together vis-a-vis -vis other ideas and try to look for connections. So in a way, you're, you're like doing a kind of conceptual mapping. Remember what we did in uh, literature mapping, right? So in, in a way, it's also something like that. You're trying to make sense of your qualitative data, right? And the first step of trying to make sense uh, your, your qualitative data, your qualitative data is basically to organize them through codes or labels. Now, after that, after you've organized your textual data or qualitative data into codes or labels. Now, the third step is basically, again, a matter of organization. We are organizing the codes into patterns. Okay? When we did the coding, we organized the ideas, the concepts, the words through codes and labels. Now, we have codes and labels. Our data, our textual data has been transformed into codes. Okay? And so, uh, the next level of analysis, we can call it thematic analysis, is basically uh, we try to organize the codes, the labels that we had into general themes and patterns. Okay? That's why we call it thematic analysis. And when we write our interpretation or analysis, it will be in the form of a thematic analysis of your qualitative data. Alright? So for now, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pause at that. And then in the coming meetings, coming discussions, we're gonna try to dig deeper into uh, the nitty-gritties on how we can do this.